I'm Walter Block. I'm Jody Emery. This is Adam Kokesh. I'm Jeffrey Tucker. I'm Ben Swan. I'm Tom Wood. I'm Peter Schiff. I'm Eric Voorhees. And you're listening to... And you're listening... And you're listening to... You're listening... You're listening to... Ed and Ethan. Soak up the awesomeness. You are listening to Ed and Ethan, the voice of liberty in Canada, coming to you from Saskatoon, the province of Saskatchewan. That's in the frozen but currently superheated wastes of Canuckistan, Canada. <laughs> Ed, say hello to the world. Hello, world. Uh, yeah. My intrepid co-host, of course, joining me today for this, our final broadcast on dailypaulradio.com. I am your host, Ethan. You're listening to us, of course, as I just mentioned, on dailypaulradio.com, as well as Liberty Express, Liberty Radio Network, LMR, Daily... But I just mentioned Daily Paul again. Uh, Freedom <laughs> Founding, so uh, VVN. Well, there, you know, we are in so many corners of the web. We're happy to be there, and of course, this is our final sign-off. So we'll, we, you know, we'll we'll talk about that in the after yes, show. Yes. No need to get into that. You can download the after show, of course, at our website, edandethan.com. So feel free to go over, you know, a swagger on over. Uh, is that a can can you do is, can you verbalize can you verbiate swagger? Is that that is a verb, right? I guess so. <laughs> I, I I I was I read, I read somewhere somewhere something about swag. It meant some. It's an acronym for something. Oh, and okay. It's, uh, of the homosexual. Uh, Thing really, this something? seems yeah. like something I should know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hmm, that's weird. All right. So anyway, to to okay to sign off to to, to do our final broadcast, uh, we figured shucks, let's do something not at all controversial. <laughs> not you know doesn't push any buttons. Uh, is a topic maybe we've avoided for some time simply because yeah. it's so blasé. Uh-huh, right. Well, I'm talking, of course, about the Israel Palestine conflict. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, I haven't even really posted on Facebook about this. My perspective, I don't know about you, Ed, I'll get to you in just a second, but my perspective is essentially to be on the side of peace. I don't really like taking, Mm quote-unquote, sides. Mm -hmm. I see this as an abhorrent sort of violent situation that exists. I, I just want peace to erupt. I would agree. I'm against murder. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, not at all contentious, right? So anyway, uh, to join us today, we have Noah Scheindlinger. I probably should have asked her how to pronounce her name. We'll get to her in just a second. But Noah is, she was born and raised in Tel Aviv. She attended Tel Aviv University for her undergraduate degree in history. Uh, she she has been involved in a number of uh, pro-peace groups in Israel. She is currently studying abroad in Toronto, Ontario. She's written a few articles for uh, the online magazine Plus 972, uh, and she is currently writing her dissertation, uh, and we'll ask her about that, at the uh, Department of Near Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Toronto. So, Noah, she joins us now. How does the day find you? Oh, it's uh, it's another gray morning here in Toronto. <laughs> right. In Saskatchewan, we've been, of course, blisteringly hot. And in Toronto, Ontario, you have had cool sort of uh, weather akin to the coastal provinces of Canada. Lucky, so lucky. very envious. Noah, you are currently with Anarchists Against the Wall. Hmm. Uh, and I'd like you to tell me a bit about that organization. Is that an Israeli or a Palestinian organization? And what are the goals of Anarchists Against the Wall? So, Anarchists Against the Wall is uh, is an Israeli um, collective, which uh, was founded in uh, 2003 around the struggle against the uh, the wall and the fence, right? That Israel started to build. Hmm. Um, it started really almost by accident, just because a few um, a few Israeli activists came to a protest tent in the, in the village of Masha. Okay. And then one night um, they were talking, and they decided to become this collective around around this particular struggle. Okay. So this particular struggle being the wall that segregates uh, Palestinian and Israeli neighborhoods. Is that is that a fair characterization? Give me an idea of what the wall, the infamous Israeli wall, is all about. So let's put it this way. Um, Israeli rhetoric is all about, oh, we need, it's about self-defense, right? We're defending ourselves from 
terrorists. Hmm. However, if you actually look at the map, you'll see that what the wall does is separate Palestinians from other Palestinians. Hmm. So, first of all, separating Palestinians from their own agricultural lands, hmm. which, you know, are there um, annexed to um, settlements. And it's about segregating Palestinians from other Palestinians. For example, in Jerusalem, where you have neighborhoods that are just cut in the middle by this wall. Hmm. So you can have one family member on one side of the wall and then another family member on the other side of the wall. Hmm. And uh, like your school, right? Your business beyond the wall. Hmm. Kind of reminds me of Berlin. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people are saying that. Yeah. Hmm. I, it's actually kind of interesting. I had never even really thought of that I comparison, thought about that, Ed. But that, that is yeah. that is a good comparison. You know, there's something here. Look, when we think of Israel Palestine, we think of the Israeli state as being it's supposed to be. Uh, from my interpretation, kind of a, a safe haven for Jews, right? So people like myself are supposed to be able to go to uh, Israel. It's our own kind of country. Uh, we get to enjoy a Jewish state, um, which, by the way, just seems weird to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely <laughs> I, to me as well. And I grew up there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, well, okay, but what what is, what is as, as somebody who's studied history, Noah, what is your interpretation of why an Israeli state was even started to begin with? Why, why did uh, our people, uh, to put the to use the term very loosely, why did these people decide that we needed an Israeli state? What was the motivation and the impetus for all of this? So you have to understand that Zionism is a product of the 19th century. And Zionism um, really um, is an offshoot of, you know, both European, you know, nationalism and colonialism. You know that nationalism and colonialism are um, um, basically two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not going to go into this whole literature, but I mean, even if you think if, if, if you think they're not connected, then in fact, in the 19th century, like uh, um, the idea of this having this um, unique national identity was very much linked to colonialism, to controlling other territories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so Zionism is in fact um, a product of this. And it, you know, and it, uh, it, sort of, it sort of came about in Eastern Europe at a time where... Um, in 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 the Russian Empire, where Jews were were um, you know persecuted, hmm. right? So um, there were different kinds of responses to this plight. One of the minority responses was Zionism. In fact, most Jews in Eastern Europe and Western Europe, of course, were not Zionists, and and mm -hmm. basically until the Holocaust, right? The mm. majority of Jews were not Zionists. But the Holocaust served as uh, an incredible, frightening motivator for that to become all more popular. Would that be right? Well, I would say still no. The majority of Jewish refugees in the, in the camps in Europe really did not want to go to Palestine. They mm. wanted to go to the U.S. However, um, the... Zionist organizations were um, pressuring the U.S. and the U.K. to not let those refugees in, hmm. basically to leave them only the option of coming to Palestine. Mm -hmm. So a lot of reluctant Jews ended up coming to Palestine. Well, I do know there are other factors as well. I mean, our own Canadian Prime Minister Mackenzie uh, King yes, was right. virulently anti-Semitic. In yeah. fact, mm -hmm. I believe it was uh, he decided he, he determined that no Jew would own property connected to his because you <laughs> icky, right? So we, <laughs> so, so there are, there are so many other problems. You know, Ed and I always talk about immigration, the idea that people need permission to move around. It's something we 
you find abhorrent. Mm -hmm. And this is a major contributing problem, it seems, post-World War II or even during World War II. Jews not being allowed to move wherever they bloody well please because of imaginary lines created by governments everywhere. This is something that we have a big problem with. But now, now I know the the Jews were persecuted like f- since like for a long like like forever type of thing. <laughs> it see it seems like that you read the history and it's like they're always being persecuted. Ah, we just whine <laughs> a lot. But <laughs> I'm um, kidding. I, sorry, go ahead, Ethan. I know you have an idea of where this needs to go. Well, I have a sidetrack story that I could go on with. Maybe we'll talk about in the after in the second segment. Yeah. Maybe something like that. Well, we okay. So we're we're talking about the impetus for the creation of a Jewish state, right? So it comes down to Zionism becomes at least popular oh. enough. Well, I, I want to kind of maybe uh, could you. Some people hear this word Zionism and they think that you oh. are you are you are anti-Semitic by saying that word. I guess lots of people associate it with. You call someone a Zionist, you are anti-Semitic. That's horrible. I mean, Zionism is an ideology and, of course, a practice because there is a state. I, it, it has nothing to do with Judaism, really. I mean, they are Christian Zionists, right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are um, many Jews who are anti-Zionists, like myself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, um, until the Holocaust, most of the Jews in this world were at least Mm non-Zionist, if not anti-Zionist, right? I mean, seriously, one of the things that Israel did as a state is attach Zionism with Judaism in a way that people now connect them, like, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, intuitively. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, that creates a lot of problems. I mean, if you think about... um, some of the recent reactions in particularly in Europe to the atrocities in Gaza, this linkage, right, between Zionism and Judaism that Israel created, in fact produced um, you know, anti Semitic responses. Mm-hmm. So in many ways, Israel and was a Zionist state is creating and enhancing anti-Semitism and then feeding off it, right? Because it's easy Ah. to accuse people. It's very easy to accuse people of being anti-Semitic to silence them. Mm -hmm. Isn't that an all too familiar tune (laughs) with certain (laughs) imperialist nations creating terrorists around the world Uh. and then decrying terrorism and declaring a war on it? Hint, hint, you might know who I'm talking about. Uh, (laughs) See, so... This is a problem, of course, with an Israeli state is absolutely right. This linkage between uh, the people and the atrocities of the state. We, I, you, I will be very unforgiving here. Mm-hmm, but, mm-hmm. however, Noah, answer me this. Isn't Israel a bastion of democracy and freedom in a backwater dirge that is the Middle East? This is something we hear all the time, that oh Israel God. is a... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Noah. I know that probably hurt. Okay, but this is the, this is a very common objection, right? So Israel is a democracy. Gosh, it's like the only democracy over there. People, get oh, get your heads on straight. Um, it's uh, it's got an elected government. Uh, We've got a rock now too, Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a good democracy there too. So okay, but an- answer that answer that sort of objection though. Isn't isn't Israel at least uh, hasn't it achieved some semblance of being kind of a developed, westernized, free world kind of oriented nation. Isn't that a good thing? (laughs) You know, um, Zionists, European Zionists have always sort of imagined um, first, you know, um, their role in Palestine and later on the state of Israel as being like um, using this colonial imagery of a villa in the jungle. That's what I mean by Zionism is really a child of colonialism. It's a, mm. it's a colonial movement. The idea that first, you know, we'll come in and we're going to civilize mm. the savages. We're going to bring progress and civilization. Of course, later on, they just were just about expelling um, mm. the savages. But... You know, but that that's the whole idea of we're the only democracy in the Middle East is actually coming from that, right? We're the we are supposed to be the role model for this for this region. But of course, I mean this is this is only 
you know, the sort of the image that they like to project. Um, Israel has never been a democracy. I mean, seriously, a state that defines who can be who can be uh, an automatic citizen by basically by blood. Right. <laughs> well, what about Noah? Aren't there uh, elected members of government from the Palestinian population? Uh, isn't it supposed to be fair and balanced in that way? You know, Palestinians are able to vote, that kind of thing. So it's supposed to be very fair and level, isn't it? That's, that's the first of all, just the fact that there are election and the, and the fact that you have minority elected to parliament doesn't make it a democracy. You have elected minorities in Bahrain, in Iraq, in other places, um, <laughs> even in Syria, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you wouldn't call that those countries, right? Democracy. Come on now. Bahrain is is a fine and dandy democracy, no, and I won't have you bashing it on this show. I mean, sure, they murdered a bunch of people and all that stuff, but really, that's neither here nor there. You know, it's a good point, though, right, is is because you have this uh, a minority elected, it's it's kind of a, a very straw man argument to say, look, we, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great democracy. We have all of these uh, Palestinians elected government. See, isn't it fair? But, but Noah, specifically, why isn't it fair? I mean, uh, are are we looking at you take my ill-informed view on this <clears throat> it seems to me as though the, there is a population a segment of the population that is being actively suppressed and violently so and and just because they have a right to be uh, to elect some people to minority positions doesn't mean really that they have any freedoms at all that those minority positions are essentially powerless to defend them from the aggressions of the state is that a fair characterization yeah exactly i mean first of all the kind of um, the kind of political parties that can be elected, right? I mean, um, they're they're constantly scrutinized hmm. over what they can say or do, right? I mean, every single time, every single election, there is some kind of a Supreme Court appeal against <laughs> this or that political party. <laughs> really. <Wow. laughs> <laughs> That's comically bad. <laughs> I'm sorry. And now, and now, in fact, um, um, several <laughs> months ago, um, the the Knesset, the Parliament, um, managed to pass a law that I mean, it's complicated, but effectively, what it might do. I mean, the the intention behind it is to eliminate what they call small parties, which means basically they're going to eliminate all the Palestinian parties, unless all those parties are going to somehow unite. Right? Okay. What, what, can you give me a little bit more detail? What sort of implications does this law have? Is it, because I, I think of in the United States, for instance, right, the, this bastion of, of democracy or, or representative government, <laughs> republicanism, uh, republicanism. Y- you have these, these, say you want to run as a, uh, a Democrat or a, a Republican in a lot of states, you just kind of have to pay a fee. No signatures required. You get to run in a primary. However, if you want to run on a third party ticket, say Libertarian or Green Party or any other sort of uh, a smaller party, you, in some states you have to collect thousands of signatures, pay yeah. exorbitant fees. You know, so basically it's this, it's this two party system by law. Is mm-hmm. that something that you're looking at the creation of in 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 Israel, or or is it something? different it wasn't this way it was never this way it was always a multi-party system right um you know because you know the saying two jews three opinions (laughs) (laughs) yeah i've heard that one not for a long time though but i'm but i'm I'm asking specifically about the creation of this law because you're talking about the uh, limiting the ability of smaller parties to participate in the democratic exercise is that something that you are looking at uh, into the near future or is it different so here's the thing so it's a multi-party system and so you could have 30 40 parties running you know Mm -hmm. But in order to be elected into the parliament, in the Knesset, you have a certain, you have to win a certain percentage of the total votes. Right. Um, And that percentage has now been, um, has now been risen to... 
Oh. Whatever. Oh, I see. So your proportional representation system is becoming more exclusive by raising, yeah. by, 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 by excluding smaller portions more and more so. Exactly. I understand. Okay. That, that is pretty damaging to smaller parties. Uh, and you say it's going, only going to be, the, it's going to affect the Palestinian parties yes. mainly. Yeah. Yes. That's the hmm. idea. So <clears throat> more about the wall, because uh, I do want to get back to this and, and we are uh, nearing the end of the first segment. And, you know, I do want to leave also some time to talk to well, you about I, I, anarchism is in general. Yeah, but I want to know why the Palestinians so upset. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the, Jew, the, the Jews just come there and they're like, oh, okay, we're going to spread democracy and, you know, here's, we can vote. Well, let me and, characterize and, you know, it this way. Dennis Prager, conservative commentator, says that one side wants the other side dead and he leaves it at that, oh, right? Oh, so that's right, that's right. Palestinians want Israelis dead and it's that Wipe simple. Them off the map or something. So, so thing, Noah, yeah. what's the big deal? What's, what Palestinians, what are they so upset about? Well, first of all, nobody want. I mean, maybe Israelis want Palestinians dead, but Palestinians, you know, Palestinians for, you know, if you look at the history, it was never about killing Jews or pushing Jews into the sea. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, imagine that you've been, you know, you are, say, a farmer, right? You lived in this uh, rural community forever. And, you know, and then suddenly all these newcomers from Europe come in and let's say they come in um, under, you know, under the colonial, under the British colonial rule, right? Because British, um, the British came right after World War One. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and suddenly the rules, the, the law of the land favors these newcomers, Hmm. They start getting more and more land, you know. You see them basically getting all chummy with, you know, with the British. The British are arming them. Now, how, you, did, how did they get this land? Did they, did they buy it or did they just expropriate it? Or <laughs> So, okay. So, in order to understand what's happened, you have to go back to the 19th century to the Ottoman Empire. Hmm. So... You have to understand that for generations, land was cultivated um, communally. Okay. Right? Hmm. So there was no, like, this idea of private honor ownership um, is, was alien, right? Completely hmm. alien. However, in the 19th century, the, 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 the Ottoman Empire went through a few waves of reforms, and in 18th if in 1858, they initiated the land reform. And what the land reform really created is forms of private ownership. Now, a lot of the, the, the peasants, even though they had the, the option of registering the land under their name, they were afraid to do that because registering land under their name means two things. It means and we'll, <clears throat> we'll get to those two things <clears throat> after the break I'm, because I'm on right the edge now, of my seat right now, man. That's, that's right. But right now we have to let some advertisers appropriate okay. our space, <laughs> which is fine. We don't want to kill them. They're fine. We love we advertisers. Give, give it to them, yes. Right, okay. So right here on the stream on dailypaulradio.com, you'll hear some wonderful messages. Don't worry, we, this is all a voluntary transaction, no force being applied. We'll be back right after the music. More with Noah Scheinlinger from Anarchists Against the Wall on dailypaulradio.com. This is Ed and Ethan. The Electronic Frontier Foundation, or EFF, fights to protect your rights in the digital world. When a patent troll threatened podcasters, they fought back. EFF has also defended your right to encryption and has sued the NSA to end the government's mass suspicionless surveillance. There are different ways you can help EFF, from donations to signing petitions to writing your representatives to just spreading the word. Find out more at EFF.org. That's EFF.org. Zombie what brains? Now from Global Editor, the news hour with Gordon. Brains. Brains. This is CTV News. Brains. CBC News. Ah. Brains. 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 
Nerds. The Ed and Ethan Podcast. Come to where the brains are. Once more, we return, and it's time. See, that was completely nonviolent, right? Yes, it was. All of the advertising, voluntary, that's the idea. Exchanging property that people own, that's okay. But maybe that's not exactly what happened here. So we're getting into this. Mm -hmm. We're talking, of course, with Noah Scheinlinger. By the way, am I pronouncing your last name right, Noah? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that sounded very confident. Okay, fine. Well, you know, it's good enough, I suppose. So, Noah with Anarchists Against the Wall. By the way, awalls.org, that's A-W-A-L-L-S dot org, uh, is where you'll find more from Anarchists Against the Wall. So, Noah, you were getting into a history lesson telling us why all this came about. So, let's continue where we left off. Uh, you said there were... Uh, I was paying attention to my timer, so... <clears throat> He said there were two things to be paying attention to here, right? Yeah. So if you're a peasant and up until now you, you know, you worked on your land communally, suddenly the empire comes to you and said, well, now you can register your plot of land, right? Hmm. In your name. However, you're worried about two things. One is, of course, taxes, right? Mm -hmm. If it's registered (laughs) by your name, they're going to come and, you know, Take your money. Mm-hmm. The other thing is compulsive military service. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Huh. Right? Which is not fun. <laughs> no. And so, and so, what happened was that a few very rich, big landlords, you know, uh, volunteered and said, how about we, we are going to register your lands in our name? It's just a formality. Don't worry about it. And so what happened was that several big absentee landlord, landlords sort of appeared, right? They started, they started to accumulate all this land, and they, they never lived on this land, right? They had these peasants working this land, and they were living usually um, along the coast in the big cities. Um, a lot of them not even in Palestine, but in Lebanon, right? In Beirut. Okay. And what happened was the Zionists... Um, um, you know, exploited the situation and they approached these landlords and they offer them money for these lands. Now, what happens? The landlords have no problem. I mean, they're not attached to that land, right? Right. They would sell them land, and but the land is inhabited, right? There are people living there and have been living there for, for generations. And so even... In the late 19th century and early 20th century, there are whole scenes of poor peasants being evicted from their ancestral lands because they were, it was bought mm-hmm. by, um, by designers in order to build colonies on. I mean, I mean, even Zionist writers, you know, describe the scene as horrific, you know, mm. like having to having to, right? Expelling all these peasants. So, are you saying here that this was, in fact, contractual? That, that these, there are people that did sell off their lands or uh, register them to a landlord because that does, in fact, seem fairly voluntary to me. Uh, well, the people who live there never agreed to any of it, right? It's the people who, you know, it's, it's again, the exploitative, you know, um, agricultural, uh, you can call it capitalism, right? Capitalizing the land. Well, we have nothing against to, capitalism. To, to, but me, to me, it makes sense that it was a, it's a state problem. Because if the, if the peasants didn't want to actually own their land because of their fear of military service and taxation, to me, that's the state meddling with their, own, their property. Right. And if, and if the people want to get together and own the land in common, they have that right too. Right? They have that ability to, to do that with their land. But uh, to me, it seems, seems like the state comes in there and messes with things and, and kind of forces someone's hand. In the a state way. and the notables, right? Those who exploited it. 
Well, the the state is always exploited by the notables, right? The state it, it, that is what it, what corporatism is, right? Mm-hmm. It, it it's using a violent organization that imposes force upon people to uh, drive an agenda that otherwise cannot be achieved through voluntary means. Yeah. Now, I, I want to get into more of the the because we we share we share a philosophy, but we also have some uh, butt heads with our with the philosophy. But we want to get into that a little bit later. So. Okay. So now, so now we're say we're coming up to the British ha- have essentially taken control of the the land. Um, mm-hmm. Now that uh, this was in before before World War II happened, was yeah. there a lot of Ju- uh, Jewish people coming to Palestine at that time? So under the British mandate, more and more European Jews um, started to come in, um, particularly in the 1930s. Right. Okay. And now, in the 1930s, it was also quite clear that um, the, the Zionists intend to create a Jewish state. They are the minority, remember, they are the minority mm-hmm. in this country, and yet they decided to create their own state. It was quite clear. They had the backing of the British that were the protectorates, essentially. They were the backing. They had the backing of the British, even though sometimes, you know, the British had to sort of say, "No, wait, wait, hang on a second. We have to be fair, mm. right?" <laughs> but but really, I mean, they had the backing of the British. Um, also, in the in the thirties, there were more and more um, Zionist paramilitary groups. Mm, I was going to ask you about this. So now, did was there? Did we see any violence? Did we see any Jewish Palestinian conflict? Uh, violent conflicts? In that period before World War II? Yes. So starting in 1920, 1921, it's sort of the real, I would say, the real um, kind of beginning of um, intercommunal um, violence. Okay. Hmm. And then in 1929, of course, um, and then throughout the 30s in particular, um, 1936, to 1939, that's the Great Arab Revolt. Mm. Um, it's an anti-colonial revolt, so mm-hmm. it was mostly against the British. Although Zionist historians like to portray it as pogroms or whatever, but it was mostly um, anti-colonial revolt, revolt against the British. The British also used Jewish paramilitary groups against Palestinians, right? Mm. So. Um, yeah, by that point, by 1939, um, it was all about, it was, it, it was obvious that, um, that at some point, you know, things are going to come to a head. Now, now, would you say, would you p- portray that the Palestinians revolting or was, was that a legitimate pushback or would you say that they went and, and did atrocities, uh, you know, they, they, that wasn't cool or was it? Was this completely legitimate in your eyes or, you know, like if someone attacks you, you have the right to defend yourself? The 1936, 1939, like the big one? Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, okay. I mean, you know, they really attacked for the most part British military convoys, British installations. Hmm. Um, I mean, and I believe in the right of the occupied to rise up against occupation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It... <laughs> it's incredible because this was like we're talking like less than ten percent or more than ten percent of the population was Jewish at the time. Yeah, around there. Okay, yeah. Yeah. in that neighborhood, it's it's difficult for me to conceptualize all of this because you know, as I said earlier, I take the side of peace. Right, I, I don't like any groups organizing to engage in conflict, but. I don't know. There's, I've been made recently to look at the current state of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, mm-hmm. and I can't really find an equal ground. It seems to me as though Israel really is pulling out all the stops as an aggressor here. Yeah, uh, but Noah, how would you respond to somebody saying, look... Uh, Palestinians have engaged in things like suicide bombings. They have 
they have visited terror upon the Jewish population or the 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 lands of Israel. So they came in and kidnapped people from Israel, and I think that's the the latest. Uh, Stir up. Oh, wasn't that found out to be false? Though oh, I didn't. It was. <laughs> so, <laughs> Look at that. But, but isn't there isn't there isn't there a, a, a great deal of fear that there is violence coming from Palestinians, and that's why all of this is being done? You know, that's really the the motivation in contemporary society today is to keep people safe. Yeah, but the problem is that people don't know that the root problem, really, of this whole situation is 1948. Okay. Let's right? get into 1948. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so pumped. I'm, gonna, I'm so interested in what's going on here. No, I okay, mean, so. seriously, the problem is not 67 and the occupation of the West Bank okay. and the Gaza Strip. Okay. The problem is 1948, which is when the British left, right? Mm. And, I mean, Israel was created, but what it actually means is that the majority of the Palestinian population was forcibly removed, were expelled hmm. from their homes, from villages, from hundreds of villages and towns and cities, and they all became refugees. And only a minority, that's how Palestinians became a minority. That's how you create, you know what, that's how you create a democracy, by expelling the majority, right? <laughs> by becoming a majority. Yeah. And, oh. you know, when, you know, when you when when Palestinians had to be, I mean, you know, they had to watch how their homes are being taken over by by migrants, right? They're not allowed to come back, and that's that's actually the major issue: not being allowed to come back, which is against international law, right? Mm -hmm. um, and living as refugees for decades—that is the root problem. And now, now, how come? Though we attach the word terrorism to um, only to non-state actors, <laughs> like you know what I mean, like like um, mm -hmm. like resistance organizations. But why can't we think about state terrorism and the ways in which the state is in fact in possession? of all these means of violence that, by the way, that that anti-colonial um, anti -colonial resistance organizations just don't have access to. So how come, you know, um, Israel is talking about, oh my God, if we give them a seaport, they're going to get, you know, they're going to get shipments of weapons from whatever, Iran or whatever, but Israel keeps getting the latest weapons from the u.s and that's mm -hmm. fine mm -hmm. and uh noah oh man you bring up a solid point there so the definition from dictionary.com of terrorism the use of violence and threats to intimidate or coerce especially for political purposes i would agree to state every state is a terrorist entity they use violence and threats mm -hmm. on their own population to extract taxation and to extract uh, do what I say, otherwise I'm going to attack you. That is terrorism. I will yeah. fully agree with you. Hmm. So this terrible problem in history, it seems to boil down. I don't know if I mentioned already uh, Dennis Prager, because he has a, a video that makes the rounds every so often. It's got great animation in it. But um, uh, he boils this down to, uh, I think I did mention this, yeah, one did. side wants the other side dead. So the idea is that Palestinians just want Israelis dead. And, and the argument is essentially that <clears throat> this group of people is just full of evil and hate. You know, they're possessed of demons. <laughs> it's pretty much how it is. But it's so simplistic an argument. It ignores the violence that is uh, visited against these people uh, yeah. in, in favor of the aims of the state. So, Noah, it seems to me here that especially this wall that is erected by Israel uh, yes. is a visitation of violence against yeah. the individuals that are mainly Palestinians. So, can you give me any uh, specific examples of how the wall disrupts daily life in an unfair fashion. I'll actually I'll give you one example to give you some context of what I'm looking for. I know that there are uh, these sorts of passes that people can get uh, from uh, from the Israeli government to 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 uh, go outside of the wall, and they give these passes. I think to Doctors Without Borders, 
but then Doctors Without Borders can't give the passes to Palestinians because of some bureaucratic muck up. So uh, examples like that, I might, I don't know, does this stuff kind of happen routinely? Is that kind of a cherry picked example of, of restricting people's movements? What's the situation oh, for it's Palestinians? Much, much worse. Much, much worse. It's tell me, much why, tell me worse. how. I mean, think about, think about, <coughs> excuse me, think about, um, you know, um, the majority of the population in the West Bank and Gaza, actually, are Muslims, but they can't go worship in Jerusalem, mm-hmm. for instance, mm-hmm. right? They just can't. Um, how about, and um, I wrote about it once, there is a house in Bethlehem right by um, Rachel Tomb. So it's supposedly, you know, a very um, touristy area, right? right. And this, this house, at the very bottom, there are two stores, and they have always sold all kinds of knickknacks and, you know, stuff that, that, that pilgrims and tourists like. Well, what happens when the wall and it's 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 like this huge monstrous wall surrounds the house on three sides what (laughs) yeah it surrounds the house on three sides so now the tourists of course can't get there because rachel tombs in on the other side right and the people who live there they open the window they open the door and all they can see is wall, and of course, um, there's surveillance cameras right, right into the bedroom, wow, right man. into their their um, bathrooms. What? Yeah, she showed me. I mean, we walked around, and she showed me. And you know, and the kids, you know, like if you think about it, the kids can't really play in front of the house because the wall is, you know, right in front of the house. The army knows about their every move. So a couple of years ago, um, a crew from um, 60 Minutes, you know, the American television, sh- television show, the CBS yeah. show, uh, 60 Minutes came and they did a segment in Bethlehem and they interviewed the lady who lives in this house and she owns that business that now is ba- barely functional, right? Um, and and um, they interviewed her. And the segment aired in the U.S. and it, you know, and, and, and in front of, of many millions. And then the next day, she was summoned to an interrogation. Wow. Right? Because she dared sort of complain. And, you know, and, and they keep threatening her. So, like, for instance, she had a, has a permit to go to Jerusalem. Well, they said, well, you know, we can make life really hard for you. And not let you go through. You know what I mean? Jeez. And she was she's afraid. Yeah, well, so. yeah, I would imagine so. Yeah. They, you know, this is why I'm looking at and, and you know, there that that's a mild example of why I'm looking at the Israel Palestine you know, conflict and thinking I can't find any high ground for Israel. You know, I, I was I was talked about how the this reminds me of the Berlin Wall and I was actually incorrect. The Berlin Wall I went to Berlin when I was in Europe and the Berlin Wall was completely different jurisdictions controlling each side of the wall in uh, israel it is yeah. israel controls both sides they just yeah. use the wall as another deterrent i guess yeah. yeah another control mechanism it's just man it's it's worse than you think it is it, it really is. is it's it's much much worse and when you see when you drive along the wall p- parts of the wall are is a fence right but if you if you drive along the wall and you'll see um People living, like for example, a house that is surrounded on all four sides. <laughs> what? And he has, yeah, and this guy has only one gate. And at first, the army wouldn't even let him have the key. So he was basically, he, him and his family were living in a cage. Wow. Whoa. So wow. you have all of these stories, um, you know, and people whose livelihood is on the other side of the wall. Right. So what what is Israel's uh, the the reasoning for the wall? What what is their excuse to build this giant wall? Well, their excuse, as always, is security. Right? (laughs) Um, They claim that if they build this wall, they're going to prevent um, what they call suicide bombers. Right. Right. 
Um, but, you, you know, I mean, like I said, if you look at the map, you'll see that it's not about security. It's about control. It's about mm -hmm. maximum land annexation without Palestinians, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's about separating Palestinians from Palestinians. Mm -hmm. That's the idea of walls and checkpoints and all those other means of control. Don't forget the checkpoints, right? Don't forget the kind of humiliation, like the daily kind of humiliation that people have to go through in order to get from point A to point B. Yeah. So, you know what? I'm just kind of... So, Hamas Hamas is, is the organization that... The governmental organization that is in control of Gaza right now. Now, I'm, I'm certain that they are the, the... On their platform, in their party officially, it says that... They want they want the destruction of Israel or, or, or something something along those lines. Now the the Palestinian Authority I think is what it's called the ones that are in control of the West Bank they are more uh, not so hardcore I guess could be the the, the mm -hmm. term. Do you ever see uh, a two state solution? Uh, is that even a, a solution? Do you see that even happening? Do you see some type of peace somewhere happening? What do you what do you what do you figure? Oh, goodness. Um, so I speak, well, of course, for myself here. Um, but there's no such thing as a two-state solution. Because remember, if the root problem is 1948 and not 1967, then the problem is, in fact, you know, um, the occupation of Palestinian lands and, and you know, and, and, and the expelling of the population inside what you call Israel proper, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So a two-state solution would only would not solve this. It would only cement the problem. That's the idea of Oslo, right? In order mm. to cement the occupation. I mean, you can't. It's it's not. It's never going to work. I mean, also the Israelis don't. The Israelis don't want a two-state solution, right? I mean, that's why they keep building more settlements in the West Bank. That's mm -hmm. why they are annexing more land. I mean, they don't, they don't want to give that up either. So I would, I would, maybe you would agree with the Onion article that uh, the, <laughs> the, best, uh, the best solution is a, a 300 million or a 30 million state solution where every single <laughs> like person that. is their own state. Uh, in in I, I would agree the world right you could say you get six billion million six billion <laughs> seven seven billion seven billion plus. state solution but wouldn't the best solution <laughs> would be a no state solution yeah like really mm -hmm. well yeah no <laughs> that's, than, that's what I, Ed I, is talking I'm about I'm joking but it's secession true, down to the last uh, the individual. down to the individual yeah. right so so states be gone no need for them anymore and that's that's why I'm I'm so kind of uncomfortable about even the thought of taking a side in such a conflict. I just want violence to disappear. And to me, states are fundamentally about the imposition yes. of violence on the individual. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a good answer. I like that. Yes. <laughs> Whenever I speak and somebody says yes or nods their head in agreement, I think that's a good, good situation. So Noah, just to end off here, um, Ed's asked you about the potential of the future, two-state solution, probably not going to work. Uh, just a quick tidbit. It seems to me that in, in the most depressing sense, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is almost used like a weapons testing sort oh, of lab. Man. Uh, it, it, it seems like this also drives uh, the victimization of people in the two minutes that we have left here. Do you think that's hyperbolistic, crazy conspiracy talk, or is there some currency to that idea? Oh, it's absolutely. I mean, Gaza is the testing ground for the Israeli weapon industry. Look at the stocks of Elbit, which manufactures drones, right? It went huh. up like crazy. Hmm. You know, Israel is, is, is one of the, you know, one of the biggest, basically one of its biggest exports is weapons, you hmm. know, weapons and the, the, the know-how, right? So, um, like, like the Ferguson Police Department and actually went and studied, right, the Israeli military. That's what I mean by know-how. <laughs> Oh, well, the, a okay. lot of a lot of uh, police forces from around the world go to train with yeah. uh, Israeli Israeli military forces mm. as well, right? Wow. So, yeah. 
uh, there, it's it's something that's not often talked about. And I think when I look at the conflict, I see it as, you know, this terrible testing ground. I think back to, uh, you know, cases from the Holocaust where Jews were experimented on. Today, it seems like Jews are experimenting on Palestinians to test weapons, one of the biggest industries in Israel. But people don't typically even take notice of that. The thought is just abhorrent. But Noah, it seems like that really is a a reality of Israel today. Yep, and it's uh, it's a scary reality. It's the fact that you know um, the majority of uh, Israeli Jewish um, society today has no problem with the kind of violence, like with the kind of state violence, right? Mm. Um, in fact, supports it, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, if if you've seen. If you've seen like the latest kind of you know T-shirts designed, you know supporting total violence. It's it's something. It seems to be something that a belief in a state engenders. Noah, I want to thank you very much for your thank time you so today much. for coming on the show from Anarchists Against the Wall. Noah, thanks a bunch for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Same here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So on the stream here at Daily Paul Radio, this is, of course, Ed and Ethan signing off. It's our final episode, and we thank you so much for having joined us all these years. Tip these couple years. to everyone listening. Thank Indeed. you much. Indeed. Thank you so much. Visit us at edandethan.com for the after show. This is Ed and Ethan. Ed and Ethan.